WSDG partner Sergio Molo to introduce Gabe and Trent. Thank you very much, Justin, our, our boys of God in our webinar series. Again, super, super happy to be finishing our second series of webinars. And uh, today we have a super interesting subject regarding uh, acoustic isolation and vibration control. And nobody better than that, uh, that get this subject on the table through the lens and the vision of our uh, European leaders both Dirk Noy and Gabriel Hauser, partners of the company, managing the Europe office, acousticians, master brains, and I think that you're gonna get super high-end information, uh, case studies and techniques and ideas to share with you guys. And without more saying, uh, please welcome to the stage to Mr. Dirk Noy, our partner, my friend, the lead, of the European office. Dirk, the stage is yours. Have fun and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justin and Sergio, for the very kind introductions. Uh, hello, everybody from Switzerland. It's uh, seven in the evening here. We try to make this uh, accessible for everybody uh, throughout the world. Uh, this is still pretty OK to do this at seven e at the evening, I, I suppose. Uh, we try to get through these 362 slides in about an hour, so uh, get ready for the, the ride here. Uh, we are going to talk about three groups of uh, uh, topics, the definitions. We need to go over some of the words that we use to define isolation acoustics, some applications, what can we actually do with this? And then the third section, as Sergio already mentioned, the case studies uh, that we are going to show uh, and explain to you. So let's start with a very, very important kind of a disclaimer or explanation at the beginning. Sound isolation has nothing to do with all the things that you see on the screen at this very moment. It has nothing to do with egg cartons. It has nothing to do with prefabricated units you can buy and you can put on the wall. Uh, this will not improve your sound isolation whatsoever. However, what does improve your sound isolation is something like this. This is a perfectly sound isolated room. It will sound horrible if you play music inside, but nevertheless, it's a very well isolated uh, room. This is missing the interior doors and windows, uh, as you can see on the left side. But nevertheless, this is really a well isolated room, a room within room structure. We'll explain that what it is in a, in a, in a bit. And this is the project, what it looks like when it's done. All this interior stuff that we saw on the last slide, that's really only for changing the sound inside the appropriate space. So this does nothing for the neighbors. This does a lot for us and it's important, but it does nothing for the neighbors. So that's very important to keep that in mind. Actually, the topic we chose for today, uh, we, it, it may be a little boring. So if you have a, like a, it goes a little slow, hang on and we'll get to the case studies quickly. Okay, quietness level. That's the first thing we need to talk about. In sound isolation, in, turn, in contrast to room acoustics, for example, we always talk about two spaces. We talk about the source room. That is where the music is playing normally. We have the loudspeaker system here. Could be a club, could be a studio, could be any space that is noisy. Could be an elevator shaft even. And we have a receiver room. The receiver room is typically where the neighbors want to sleep. Or we have an internal need, like it's the recording room. We have musicians that don't want to be bothered by audio passing through this wall. You already see some of the levels here, changing a little the sound waves. We're going to talk about that in much more detail. But for now, we're going to focus on just the receiver room for the next couple of minutes. The receiver room, the right side, we have to talk about something that's maybe not so obvious. We actually have to talk about it, but it's the question of what act, what really is quiet, how quiet is quiet. We need to define the quietness level of a space before we start work. Uh, or the goal level, the target level, how quiet does the space need to be before we start the work. And to facilitate that, a uh, number of curves have been de developed that you see on the right side here. These are called the NC or noise criteria curves. And it, they are start standardized throughout the world. And if we enter a room and imagine we have a sound level meter that we can change the octave uh, where we look at, 
and we go into the room and we measure the level at this particular octave at the first one, 63, for example, and you see what we measure here with these violet dots. That is what we measure. We change the octaves on the, on the meter and that's the levels we measure. The highest curve that's still hit by the measurement, the highest pink curve that's still hit by the, uh, the violet measurement is the NC35. And that means that this room where we took the measurement now is de defined, it's a NC35 room. So uh, that's, that's what happened. So let's imagine we go to another room and we have a slightly different measurement set, like this blue set here. You see clearly visible, it's a, low, a lot more energy in the low end, but as you see in the pink curve, it's also just hitting the NC35 curve, meaning that the violet room and the blue room or from an NC point of view are identical. But if you take a look at the kind of the base data, you will immediately see that the blue room would be worse to do a recording in than the violet room. This is, a, this is a mechanism to find a way to express a complex number of measurements, like all those blue values that we have into a single number. Manufacturers of glass, for example, or acoustical doors, they like to print a single number on their, on their um, units and it's the same for the quietness level of a room. We can label the room with just one number and we don't have to deal with the, all, the, all the measurements. One little problem in parentheses is that we can have a much noisier room and a much uh, quieter room and they still have the same NC value. There is some problem inherent to that. We'll get to that later with the uh, STC values also. This is just for completeness. Uh, for the European uh, audience, we have uh, the noise rating or Grenzkurve that we use often or the preferred noise criteria that's a little stricter in the low end, uh, but it's the same idea, the uh, 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 group of curves that we refer to. For studios, I forgot to include that slide, is like maybe NC20, NC15. For classical concert halls, it can be NC5, could be the, the target level that's really, really, really silent. And one question that I often get is, why can't we just use SPL level for that? And the, Answer to that is SPL is a, a, um, a weighting in, in, uh, over many frequencies, and we could have a level on just one frequency, like 1K, for example, that's very high but very narrow band, and the SPL is still, say, 15 or something, but that particular level at 1K is like 40 or 50 decibel, and that will not be permissible in the, in the NC curve, it will, because it will actually hit the NC50 curve, then in the whole, uh, the entire room, then has the NC50 and not, the, and not and the SPL would be still very low. So let's continue. Airborne and structure-borne sound transmission. That are the mechanisms that are have to be studied when we talk about sound isolation. Let's look at this. This is a very basic uh, demonstration. It's a, it's a little little visualization. I hope it shows okay. We have a, a membrane, for example, on the left side on the screen, and we have molecules can be any molecules, and that's my point. For example, air molecules, but it could also be concrete, or it can be glass, or it can be steel, or any other, other substance, or gas, or fluid. And these molecules, they transport pressure waves through the medium. And on the right side, we have the microphone or the ear, and so the pressure wave arrives at that, at that uh, target to the right. And you see in that little chart below that the speed of sound, this is meter per second, for feet per second, you have to multiply by about three. Uh, the speed of sound is really quite different in dry air. That's a normal uh, measure that we, we daily use, 344, 343 meter per second, but much quicker in water, for example, in fluids, and even more quicker in solids. So there is sound transmission with a very high speed in aluminum, for example. Let's take a look at our source room and receiver room set up again. Now we have a loudspeaker here, but let's, for uh, thought's sake, lift that loudspeaker off the floor so we certainly don't, in ha don't have any coupling, mechanical coupling with the floor. So we just really, really are looking at the airborne sound produced by the loudspeaker hitting that wall. In contrast, we also could take a little hammer and hit on the floor we have structure-borne sound produced 
at the floor. Uh, because everybody, I'm assuming everybody has uh, already seen a loudspeaker that's in this session. Uh, I am uh, quickly taking a minute to show you a, a special hammer that we sometimes use. This is a hammer. I think you can see that. That hammer goes on a surface, is being lifted to a mechanical stop. You see that there's a little stop here and being dropped. And this is actually simulating uh, operational noises of like a kitchen equipment or bathroom equipment uh, and this is a, a standardized uh, hammer that you cannot just buy this at the store you have to actually order it from an acoustical company acoustical measurement company and this is a defined weight with a defined uh, length of the hammer etc and uh, we can then make measurements using this device for structure borne sound the second thing that i want to show you i have to quickly actually go down and take it on the, from the floor because it's sitting on the floor here. Oh, but, but, uh, it's quite heavy. Oh, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna lift it up a little. This is a little unit. Da -da -da -da. Da -da -da. You see that here and here. This is a unit that has a motor in it. It's pretty big, you, you saw that. It's sitting in front of me here and it has little hammers and the hammers are with the motor are being uh, operated that they are lifted and then fall with uh, the gravity they fall to the surface that they're sitting on i'm going to turn this on very quickly because it's a very distinct sound that some of you may have not heard so far i'm not going to break my desk i already tried this out so i'm going to play this little machine for a minute not for a minute for two seconds this probably now broke everybody's audio system Nevertheless, I wanted to show you this. This is a device that is used to trigger structure borne sound in a structure. Uh, so at the lower part of this graph. And now what the really bad thing is about airborne sound and structure borne sound is that we unfortunately, once we have airborne sound, it can travel through the wall, be transferred to structure borne sound and be transferred to airborne sound again. These two types of sound, they convert into each other, unfortunately. The structure borne sound, as you can imagine, if you put that machine on a, on a floor above you, you will actually hear airborne sound being projected to you from that ceiling uh, when, when you have that ahead of, in, in front and uh, on top of you. So let's take a look at sound isolation. The end of the, the, the goal of course, of, of, of our work uh, and, and probably the interest that you have uh, while you're in this session is that we want to achieve very good sound isolation. We want to really isolate things uh, in a sonic perspective. We want to be sure to, to make a lot of noise here and that uh, somebody else does not hear that. So let's take a look at that. We have the source room. Let's uh, agree that for now, we're just gonna talk about airborne sound for simplicity a little bit. And we have this person sleeping in the receiver room. I already mentioned we have the sound wave here, but we're gonna take a look at that a little more numerically now. Let's assume that we go there with a measurement device and we actually measure at 1K. We have the octave band at 1K and we measure 80 dB SPL at 1K. It's a third octave band actually. And we go to the receiver room, we take the same device with us. Uh, we knock on the door, hello, Mr. Miller, could I please come and measure, of course, come in. We have a slightly lower level, hopefully, <laughs> because we hope that the wall is doing something. So let's assume uh, for, for uh, this example that we have a level of 28 decibel at one kilohertz. We can now define a next very important term that is the transmission loss value. Transmission loss or TL at one kilohertz, it's frequency dependent is for this particular uh, moment is approximately 80 decibel minus 28 decibel. So the transmission loss of this wall in the middle between the receiver room and the source room is approximately 52 decibel at one kilohertz. Now you may say why that one kilohertz? It is exactly why uh, that it, we have to measure at various frequencies. We have to measure at one kilohertz, which we just did. We have to measure at way lower frequencies and we have to measure at way higher frequencies. So at 
all the third octave bands need to be measured. If we do that, like we go to F3, we get a t two kilohertz. It's typically a little higher. If we get to 500 hertz or 250 hertz, it's usually a little lower. And we do this series of measurements in third, third octave bass. And we have a whole uh, array of numbers, nam namely the differences between the source room level and the receiver room level. Always the differences, the delta we're looking at. And we get a graph that looks something like this. This is the transmission loss values. Again, this is the sending level minus the receiving level. So for example, at one kilohertz, that's what we just looked at, we have here 52 decibel. That's exactly the case we just looked at uh, in the slide before, 80 minus 58. So that's this minus minus 38, sorry. And we have the, at two kilohertz, for example, as I mentioned, we have 62 decibel difference. It means if we have a 60 decibel in the sending room, we have 62 decibel less in the receiving room. This is really all getting very low in the receiving room then. So we are important to notice that we are looking at differences here, not absolute values, but differences. Um, for the very important STC translation, or in Europe, it's the RW translation, we use something else that I have to quickly show you. It's actually moving in from below. I hope this works in your end also with the animation. You see a very funky little curve, the violet curve moving upwards. This is the standardized contour curve. This scenario that I'm explaining now and also this curve, they're standardized in the entire world. Uh, the same mechanism is used everywhere. So we move this curve upwards. This goes much faster in a computer than manually or visually. Uh, until certain criteria, one of, of two certain criteria are met. We're going to not go into those de in detail right now. But there's a certain point where we stop the sliding process. So, OK, this is now good. And then we define the TL, the actually the STC value, of being whatever this violet curve is at 500 hertz. So it's like 51 STC. So this structure between the, the two rooms that we just measured, this wall in between, has an STC value of 51, coming from the transmission loss values. There's a little bit of an imprecision in, inside it because, in theory, the reverberation time of the two spaces also goes into the calculation. But we're going to not mention that today. It's also a very small number in most cases, unless it's like a cathedral or something that's very reverberant. So let's take another look at a, a scenario that is called the mass law. The mass law is uh, something that has been determined many, many years ago that for one layer uh, building materials, like for example, glass is mentioned here, or concrete, or could be gypsum wall, or any other, like a wood structure, uh, any homogeneous building material, the STC, the sound transition class, increases by six decibel for each doubling of the weight per square meter of surface. So you see here at the left side in the graph, the three millimeter glass and the six millimeter glass, and you see this line, this is the six dB Per, line, per octave, go, per, sorry, that comes later, per weight going up, uh, weight doubling. So, and you also have the, the six inch concrete and the 12 inch concrete, which is a doubling, of course, of the thickness. 30 centimeter concrete is pretty, pretty solid. And that's also a six dB increase of any, for any doubling of the weight of the material. The easiest way to increase the weight is to increase the thickness, but the parameter that really goes into the calculations is in fact the weight. There's a second part to the mass law um, scenario, and that comes in the next slide. I already kind of mentioned that. Also, for increasing frequencies, each doubling of frequency, which is a step of one octave, each, each step, it also goes up for 6 dB. So there are a couple of uh, mass law, there are two mass law scenarios that both mean that the, um, the, the Sound isolation gets higher if we have a higher mass, and also the sound isolation gets higher with the frequency get, that goes up. Okay, this is true for a wide range of frequencies, but not for all frequencies. There's something is actually spoiling this story badly. And that what spoils the story is called coincidence frequency. 
because you see on the graph on the right on the right side you see this nice mass law curve that we just kind of came up with and most materials follow that pretty uh, accurately in lower frequencies and mid frequencies but there's a certain point where this falls apart this certain point is where mechanical resonance of the actual structure coincides with the sound waves coming onto the material so there is a there's a, 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 a an actual frequency it's called the coincident frequency you see that in a second it's right here this blue dotted line coincident frequency where we lose a big part of our sound isolation capability of the material you see for low damping that's like a very flimsy material like a, a pane of glass for example it has no damping almost uh, we have a, a rather significant loss up to 15 db uh, could that be of of uh, reduction of sound isolation so this is really something we have to keep in mind the medium damping or the large damping we can kind of counteract that a little bit with large damping meaning like in a gypsum wall we actually put some some uh, um, insulation inside to to increase the damping of the of the material we'll get to that in a second as well so these are coincident frequency for various materials it is not advisable to sandwich materials on top of each other that have similar coincidence frequencies like say uh, concrete 200 millimeter and brick 200 millimeter it will increase the weight obviously so the the, the sound isolation will be better because we actually go up a little on that curve on the other hand the because the coincident frequency is almost the same we're still going to have a very big drop in sound isolation at 110 hertz or 150 hertz for example so it's advisable to combine in a sandwich that we want to achieve high sound isolation it's advisable to combine materials that have very unsimilar coincident frequencies now it gets really interesting because what can we really do to increase sound isolation we have this mass law that's fine we have the coincidence frequency that's also fine but now we get to the solution of really getting very high sound isolation within a reasonable space that we have to occupy, mass and decoupling. Optimum sound isolation is achieved by stacking of materials with very different acoustical impedance and propagation constant values. Okay, Dirk, this sounds very smart. What does this mean? We are stacking materials that are very different materials. Acoustical impedance is the resistance of a particular material to sound waves. So, for example, I'm going to first quickly mention what propagation constant values, that's the speed of sound in a certain medium, what that is. So, for example, if we have a sound wave that travels through air, to block this sound, a layer of solid material would be ideal because it has a much higher propagation constant and a totally different acoustical impedance. So, if we have a loudspeaker playing to this person and we want to actually reduce the level of loudspeaker first thing comes to mind go to the amp and turn it down but let's say that's not possible we can build a little box around it and we can surround it with a, a wood or gypsum or cardboard anything that helps because we are blocking the air molecules from exciting the next air molecules that would be accessible to it so we're going to build a little box around it so this is the first keyword that we have to keep in mind if we want to achieve good sound isolation we have to work with mass we have to get mass into the system now another sample is here a sound wave that travels through concrete like the floor for example in a building or the, the ceiling for here or a wall to block this sound a layer of air would be ideal because again concrete and air they are totally different uh, acoustical propagation constants and acoustical impedances so let's take a look at the little graph here I give you a second or two to look at this because now the animation is really really critical if i press the button here and it goes to the next slide it will show you what we really have to do this is now a concrete wall uh, this the loudspeaker is in a concrete box the listener is in, in the concrete box and we what we really, really need to do is we need to insert a layer of air between the spaces let me show you that look at the graph at the bottom that's this okay so hmm, that's smart because now even if i'd have this cool hammer that i just showed you earlier or the little machine that i showed you 
this would excite the left side, the loudspeaker, but of obviously the vibration would not be able to jump the air layer uh, to the next space. So the listener would actually be, be in, a, in a quiet environment. He would not be, he or she would not be hearing anything. So these are really the two key words to sound isolation and ultimately also at the room within room construction. We need a particular mass, high mass is good, but we just we don't, don't only need the mass, we also need decoupling of the mass. If we put one meter of concrete, which is three feet of concrete, you, we can still have this little hammer and ba ba a bump on one side and you still hear it on the other side because there's no decoupling. You still, it would still transfer through the concrete. So we need the decoupling also in the system to have this work perfectly. So these observations can be expressed by two keywords, mass and decoupling. And in fact, a clever combination of both physical mass and mechanical decoupling will result in good sound isolation. In consequence, this results in a room within room construction. So we're gonna take a little more detailed look at certain building structures. And I'm gonna pass the word to Gabriel, who's gonna explain the next couple of slides uh, to you. You'll see me again when we talk about samples of how to actually achieve decoupling. Yes, hello, everybody. Um, Dirk, I think you have to stop sharing your screen because I can't start mine. Always a good idea. Okay. So here we go. Um, that sounded very simple and good to understand. If we have mass and decoupling, we're all set. Unfortunately, that's not true uh, entirely, of course, because we're living in a real world with, you know, um, problems. If you solve one problem, you probably uh, end up with uh, two more new problems. So here we have uh, a sample of a single layer construction. I, I say single layer because it only has, it, it's like one solid uh, layer that uh, separates, uh, for example, two rooms. It can consist of multiple uh, individual layers, but they are all um, installed or mounted together with no decoupling. So that's just a solid mass, so to speak, for example, to 12.5 millimeter chips and boards. If we want to increase the sound isolation we have already seen, uh, we could just double the mass. And we end up with this uh, four layers of 12.5 millimeter gypsum, which is now pretty expensive and also labor intensive to install. And we gain six dB of isolation. If we introduce decoupling, uh, we can also get away with just four layers of gypsum in total. But as we will see uh, in, a, in a minute, we, we can increase the isolation by more than just 6 dB. Now, as soon as we do that, we end up with a mass and spring system. Um, what happens in the mass and spring system is demonstrated here. You can imagine that on top of this spring, we have the inner layer, the two layers of gypsum. Uh, down here, we have the outer layer um, of uh, two layers of gypsum, and in between is air, which is basically a spring. Now, if we uh, look at very low frequencies, which is shown here in this in this little animation on the left, maybe I can restart it um, real quick. No, I can't. Um, at very low frequencies, you will see if the animation starts again that those two layers are in phase, which means they are actually coupled. If I'm having sound uh, on the inside of the room, you can see it now for very low frequencies in the inside of the room, those two layers move in phase. So we have the same that is happening as with the mass law, we just have uh, that amount of uh, isolation. Now, if we get closer to the resonance frequency of this mass and spring system, we see that actually on the outer layer, we get more sound transmission than we would have with a non-decoupled system. And only at frequencies pretty, well, pretty much higher than the resonance frequency, this is now 1.5 the resonance frequency, 
uh, we start to see some decoupling where the inner layer is moving a lot and the outer layers suddenly or, or so we, we now this is the area where we are actually increasing the sound isolation. So that's a little bit of bad news here. Um, we can help this situation by uh, choosing the material and the layering and also um, the, the spring, like if we increase the airspace between the, the two layers, we uh, lower the, the, the spring um, um, number or the, the gute, uh, the Q of the, of the spring, so to speak. So we will look at these three constructions um, from an uh, isolation point of view. We see here on the left a simulation of the transmission loss or sound reduction index in decibels for just a single two times 12.5 millimeter gypsum board. So we see that we have this approximated mass law here in this region. And then we have the coincidence dip that we've seen before, which is around 2K for this construction, two kilohertz. And it's, as you can see, roughly 10 dB down. Uh, on, on, on this side, you can see the, the what we've already seen in, in Dirk's uh, part of the uh, presentation, this 6 dB per octave and then the coincidence dip at lower frequencies. That's just modes of the panel that really depends on the panel size and uh, the mounting of the, of the panel. So this gives us a RW value of 33 dB, these two layers of gypsum. Now, if we add uh, 50 millimeter insulation and another layer of 12.5 millimeter gypsum, we end up with this brown curve here, which is much steeper at mid frequencies, which uh, is approximately 18 decibels per octave right now. So this introduction of a second layer and of decoupling is really helping a lot. It, at 1K, it's 20, 30, it's 40 decibels higher, the isolation, and the single value number raises from 33 dB to 49 dB. So you could say this construction is 16 decibel better in sound isolation than just a single uh, layer of two times 12.5 millimeter gypsum. This is true for most frequencies, especially for frequencies that are traditionally looked at in uh, building acoustics, uh, frequencies where humans talk, where maybe uh, the television sounds for, uh, from you know, very, very old uh, television sets are uh, located. But for low frequencies, uh, like right here at 90 Hertz, we see that we actually have a large dip now suddenly appearing in our sound isolation. And this is the resonance that uh, you have seen before, where those two layers and the spring in between get into resonance and the transmission actually, uh, the, the sound reduction gets worse and you have more transmission to the other side than you would have with just the single layer of two times 12.5 millimeters gypsum. So this is something very important. And in designing sound isolation systems, including windows uh, for sound isolation, you, you have to look at low frequencies and make sure that this uh, resonance dip is actually at uh, frequencies that are not interested in, interesting in, anymore. And this would be the third example that uh, was shown before with uh, an additional 100 millimeter insulation. So we lower the spring rate and an additional four layers of 12.5 millimeter gypsum. And now we see that our resonance is around 50 Hertz or maybe a, a bit lower. So if we're not like uh, using this construction in a, in, a, in a club or in any kind of uh, music venue, we have actually a gain in sound isolation in most of the frequencies. So this is an additional very important factor of uh, what happens if we use decoupling and mass. We have to make sure that the resonance is very low. This is also uh, very helpful to use one layer of, let's say, 20, 20 centimeter concrete with air and then an inner layer of, of gypsum uh, to move this resonance frequency to a, a region where it doesn't hurt. For in illustration purposes, I chose these uh, gypsum drywall uh, examples. So now this brings us to um, the so-called room within room 
construction. Um, it, it sounds uh, fancy, it's not at all. It's really just looking at the basic structure of, of a building and then building a secondary shell uh, which supports itself basically and therefore is a room within the room. Uh, this is now the, the shell of uh, this uh, control room that we see here. Uh, the same happens of course on the floor and the ceiling uh, in, in the section and then we have a secondary room that is also separated from the basic uh, building structure, the studio shell. And here we have multiple paths that need uh, to be uh, studied. One is for, from the control room to the lounge, let's say. Um, we have some existing building structure here and we have our new layer that we build inside so we can decide on how much sound isolation we want to have here um, at the cost of space usually. Um, we, we need to have a lot of airspace between the layers as you've, as you've seen before and we need a, a certain amount of mass to actually achieve high sound isolation. And the other is between the control room and the studio which can have pretty different um, requirements in terms of sound isolation from uh, control room to lounge or control room to the outside and vice versa from the outside into the studio shell. These are all paths that need, need to be studied. There's a third one here coming up, ISO booth and another ISO booth and a sound lock. The sound lock is, is very helpful. That is something that we uh, do in almost uh, any project with really high sound isolation requirements because the doors are usually a, a very weak link, um, not just because of the leaf, uh, of, the, of the door leaf itself, but also uh, due to the frame and uh, how airtight this, this, uh, uh, this, uh, it, the door can be closed. You have a lot of mid and high frequency leakage usually uh, through the frames. So having a sound lock means you have two doors uh, until you get into the other critical room and uh, the sound lock itself can be absorptive acoustically so it helps uh, reducing the uh, amount of mid and high frequencies leaking. And then we have the same in the section we see the existing raw structure and the inner shell that also it supports, uh, supports itself which does not mean that it mechanically has to support itself, but it means it cannot have any physical connection to the existing building. And you can see here, these little red um, marks here, these are uh, springs that are uh, usually introduced uh, if a ceiling cannot be self-supporting. Uh, uh, we need to mount this ceiling to the existing structure. There's no two ways about it, but we have to do it in a way that we don't have a mechanical connection. And that is done by using uh, springs with also, again, very, very low resonance frequencies. This is uh, so critical that, that this is done right, because if the resonance frequency is too high of these springs, we actually get a gain in transmission to the other room. We have worse conditions than if we wouldn't, wouldn't have done any sound isolation in this, uh, in this room. Same is true for the floor. Um, the floor is mounted on, on springs, which can be uh, uh, jib, uh, pucks of, uh, of rubber or cork or any other um, material. We will see some examples a bit later on. And another very important fact, um, sorry, for the floor isolation is also the existing building and the existing concrete structure. Um, we might think that if we have a concrete floor that is um, stiff enough, it's uh, heavy enough, we have no problems introducing our decoupled floor, but that's usually not the case. This, this concrete, uh, existing concrete structure has a resonance frequency in itself. It has a uh, damping, it has a, a, a mass, and this has to be taken into consideration when designing the floor built up and the springs of, um, a room within room construction. So now we can um, look at some samples of uh, products that are uh, commercially available. These range from 
very simple pox made of uh, some kind of rubber to very elaborate huge metal springs that are for example used for uh, um, decoupling bridges and uh, other very heavy duty or even whole buildings uh, sometimes stand on on, on isolating uh, structures for uh, noise reduction let's say from train stations and uh, similar um, heavy duty constructions uh, Dirk, do you want to, sh how do we do this? Do you want to share your screen? I stop sharing. Yeah, I, I think you, you can maybe, well, you all see the slide now uh, with the decoupled wall and the sus suspended ceiling. I did not realize that I, sh I guess we should have made three different slides, <laughs> but maybe you can stop the screen sharing quick and I'll, I'll, I'll reactivate my camera. Oh, my, my camera is reactivated and I'm going to show some of those actual things that we prepared here. Uh, as Gabe said, uh, in, in fact, he, you didn't say that, but it, it's why it's listed first. The floor is the first thing that goes in in these projects. Uh, we want to make sure that the floor is, is level, more or less, and then the isolators go in. The isolators, as you did mention, Gabe, for example, we use this system here. That was exactly the, the picture that you just saw. This is a metal profile. Uh, this is way longer if we order it. Uh, it's the width or the length of the room uh, and, and comes in big pieces. And there are some, some uh, rubber elements in, in embedded in these. And so there's no error in putting these. And when you put this on the floor, it's, it's hard to push it because it's actually pretty, it's pretty tough to push this. I can't really do this with my thumb much. Actually, you see it a little bit. You see it moving a little bit, I think. But it's, it's right, quite, quite, quite hard to move it. But if it's on the floor and I st would step on it, it would absolutely feel like sp springy. That's exactly the goal because the energy of the sound that would excite the floor will then be absorbed in parentheses by these elements and not go to the neighbor. Uh, this is a different system. This comes in, in, in blocks like this, little cubes, uh, where you can also press these down a little. Uh, you have to put them on the floor in a predetermined matrix, X and Y, and then you can put the, the floor elements on top of that. That's for the floor. Just two samples. There, there. Are, this it's a, it's actually a commercial product. People m make this. Uh, there are maybe 10, 15 manufacturers that, that we deal with often, and there are probably even more worldwide. Uh, it's real. It's a real thing. <laughs> you can buy this. Uh, the second thing that happens after the floor goes in is the wall gets constructed. This is the piece that gave you the show. In fact, that's a little. Also, uh, this is being put onto the, 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 the wall and the stud is coming in here and is then being held so it doesn't fall down. Nevertheless, this is not a static uh, coupling connection. This is a decoupled connection because the, the steel rod actually is isolated by these rubber rings uh, that, are, that are used in this element. So this is really a decoupling system. Uh, we have to make sure that it holds, it doesn't fall down. On the other hand, we don't want to have any sound travel through these elements. This is another one. This is a, a very neat little device. You can again put on the, on the solid wall and then put the start here or the wood panel, whatever you have. And this is mechanically decoupled, but preventing of the panel falling down on, on somebody or on something. That's for the wall, I wanna explain. And then this is the heavy duty thing. This is actually really this is for clubs or really high noise environments. This, you can also use this for jet engine test stands, which we don't usually work on, but you, that's the world we're talking about. That's a ceiling spring, uh, the little red thing we, we saw in, in, in Gabe's drawing. And this little plastic piece comes away uh, once it's installed and then we have it hanging at the ceiling and then the, 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 the drop ceiling is, is suspended from this little axis here. So, and this is actually then really uh, held by the spring. The spring has to be well defined by the manufacturer. There are different colors of spring. This is, for example, this is a yellow one. You see this, this is the gray one. So the, the spring is actually really acting as a spring. If you imagine hanging an elephant from this, it's, 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 it's broken. It, it, will not, it will not be a spring. It will just be a, a dead piece of metal. And so it has to be carefully taken uh, into consideration which spring constant we use which hardness of the spring we want. And like this, for example, this is for mounting on a, on a, 
do you call that? Quer talk, <laughs> quer trager. <laughs> a not, beam. Sorry. A beam. Thank you so much, Gabe. I knew it's good to do this to two of us. Uh, and then the, the yellow, this is very weak. I can actually kind of pull this down, see that. Uh, this is for at the edge, for example. Sometimes we even have systems that in the middle of the room, it's a, it's the green spring. And at the edge of the room is the yellow spring because you have less square meters to be hanged from one single spring in a corner, for example. Uh, so this is, and this is another, this is a German example, RRG. This is another one that's basically all the same things. They, these elements, they make sure that whatever we put on them is being not coupled to the rest of the world. So in, we have our little container that we built inside the room, the room within the room, and our room within the room can do whatever it wants because it has springs on all the sides and it can, and that it will, it will compress the strings, the springs, but it will not go further to our neighbors. That's the whole, whole idea here. I'm going to mute myself now again, Gabe, and you go back to the presentation, please. Okay. So that's the basic concept. Again, the springs need to be defined one, to take the load, but B or two, <laughs> also to have the correct resonance frequency. Very, very important. So uh, two case studies real quick to uh, show how this can look in reality. This is a big uh, venue in, in uh, Vienna um, for VSL, Vienna Symphonic Library. They uh, actually bought an old an old um, scoring stage where they used to um, record audio for film. And this room up here, which is now the control room, used to be a huge Foley room. It's about 150 square meters, or it used to be. It's now smaller because we had to build a room within room construction um, in, into this existing building. You can already see that um, the building itself is of course thought of um, to be used for recording and therefore it has massive walls and a lot of airspace between uh, walls. So there are certain paths that we didn't really have to look at in terms of sound isolation. Uh, one of the major um, uh, one of the major paths was I can not find the well uh, one of the major paths was uh, the floor of the control room towards the foyer down there because you don't want to have people in the foyer that's number three um, to hear too much from what's going on in the control room so that is one of the uh, critical uh, surfaces and the other of course is the connection between the control room and the life room, the, 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 the big uh, hall. And this was not so much an issue of the walls, as you can see, because we have already very massive, substantial walls, but of the window of the glass that uh, is used uh, for the sound isolation. There used to be a, a, a concrete uh, curtain that could be um, lowered between those rooms to increase sound isolation, but of course, then you would lose uh, the visual connection between the rooms. So we decided to put that to rest, this concrete um, uh, wall, and use uh, glass to uh, achieve the isolation. Uh, you can actually, to the right here, you see that this is the lowered concrete wall now between uh, the control room and the, the hall. It is on, in the lower position. So this is going to be the glass later on. And this is the front of the control room. Um, and you can already see these, uh, these little metal strips with the isolators are being put down. And it is very important that these isolators are all level. So this was done by hand to actually level each one of those uh, isolators so that later on we could install the floor on top of it. Uh, there's going to be isolation in between, which in also increases the sound uh, isolation and the negative effect of resonance in this uh, airspace. So this is now the next step. The first layer of wood is being installed. 
in here it was two layers of OSB wood and then two or three layers of a special high density uh, gypsum flooring on top of it. You can see here towards the, the walls, these, these yellow uh, strips, these are parameter strips to make sure that the floor does not touch the wall anywhere because that of course would short circuit our uh, spring and isolation. So this is also very uh, important detail to, to check when on site. And this is now the view from the control room into the hall that is also being uh, upgraded. They, it receives a, a concert floor, a massive uh, wood flooring for uh, the instruments. And you can see here now the, the, the middle layer, the concrete layer is now high up. So we have a visual uh, connection to, to the hall. Now, this is the installation of the inner glass pane. Uh, you can see that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, people were necessary to, to lift it. It was a very, very heavy uh, piece of glass. I think it was 22 millimeters thick. Um, and uh, the idea again is to have enough mass for the sand isolation and not having to use too many layers because of the resonance dip that will get very bad at low frequencies. So we try to get away with just two layers of glass, but then they have to be heavy, heavy layers. And this is now with the installed uh, inner uh, wall of the control room with these two little build outs uh, that we will see later on why they are here. Um, you can see it here. We have the loudspeakers positions here in between and we wanted to keep as much visual connection to the hall as possible. So that's why we uh, actually tried to keep this uh, as much window as we could. So this is now the uh, picture of the finished control room. The second example is a little bit different. That's um, a new building in the middle of Zurich. Um, and they wanted to have a restaurant um, uh, in the Erdgeschoss, which is kind of the first floor, but here in Europe, this is the first floor where they have offices above the restaurant. And then they have high-end residences that they uh, actually, it's, it's apartments uh, that are being sold. So they, the owners, they're gonna buy these apartments. So we had to make sure that the sound isolation from the club uh, uh, underground, which I didn't mention before, um, the isolation is uh, good enough so that they can sell those apartments uh, from the second floor up. And of course, also from, from the restaurant. But uh, in the club, we have a much higher SPL level than in the restaurant. And the goal was to have 100 dBA in the club and still meet all the requirements um, for high-end residences uh, in the upper floors. So this is a floor plan of the club in the underground. Um, again, we see the basic structure uh, of the building. And then we introduced our inner shell uh, with isolation and gypsum. And if we just introduce an inner shell, we have a problem because people cannot really get into the club. So we also need access. And again, we introduced uh, two sound locks with two doors, one on the inside, one on the outside, same here for access and emergency exit. And these are a little bit like uh, um, sound locks. It's actually the HVAC system that is coming from even one floor uh, below the club is coming up into the club and then uh, it gets distributed here um, inside. So we also need to make sure that this does not uh, produce a sound leak into the rest of the building. And these are the final measurements that we performed after uh, finalizing this project. This is the sound isolation from the club into uh, the living room in the second floor. And you can see here at 63 Hertz, we have almost 70 dB of sound isolation and it gets higher with frequency. Up here is 90 dB sound isolation. That's pretty much the maximum that we were able to, to measure. You, you start running into uh, signal noise issues in the receiving room, of course, with such high uh, isolation measurements. Uh, we have two standards that we looked at. One is the SIA 181 Swiss standard. 
that requires uh, has a certain requirement for the sound isolation in order to be able to play at 100 dBA and the other is the uh, Cercle Brie which m just measures the sound level in the receiving room and then tells you basically how loud you can go in the club and these both uh, resulted in 99 dBA that were possible in the club. So with, with a lot of uh, effort and material put into this club, they were just able to get close to the desired sound um, um, SPL in the club. Yeah, so that's basically the presentation. Dirk, do you want to have any final words? Uh, well, we are two minutes short of eight o'clock here in Europe, <laughs> which is somewhere else two minutes short of another time. Uh, but we do have a couple of minutes. I, uh, Justin, you're listening in, I, I suppose. You may have looked at some questions. How do we want to do this? I you think, yeah, out a couple. Dirk, if you want to open up the Q&A and, and maybe take a look, there's some really great questions in there. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I see. I see the question with uh, you know, the hammer machines and the airborne noise, right? Um, the 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 hammer machine does not produce enough airborne noise compared to the structure borne. If you if you are sitting in the room below um, the hammer machine, you 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 would know that the noise that is produced airborne will not even come close. Of course, you need a separation between the rooms. You cannot make a measurements, let's say, with open windows or anything like that. But usually, the actual noise from the from the weights are is much much higher than the airborne noise. It's very uh, clearly audible in most cases. Yes, yeah. correct. Yeah. Uh, for Dirk or Gabe from Arthur, stop it. Uh, do those devices that decouple floors and walls lose their isolation quality? Qualities over the time due to the deterioration of the rubber or springs, and I'm asking about periods of time of 10 years or 20 years. We actually prefer, prepared a slide here. for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we I did not know about the question, although it's from Sergio. But uh, um, you want to show it? I have it grabbable right here. I'm I'm showing it. I think. Ah, cool. Yes, you are. Yeah. Um, this is this plays into the the thing that I said before about this spring that also has a resonance frequency that needs to be designed carefully. And you see here, this is a floor isolator, the one that Dirk showed before. And uh, it has a resonance frequency of 8 hertz, which means from 20 hertz upwards, it's actually being helpful in terms of isolation. So keep that in mind. You have to be far away from the resonance frequency. Uh, until the system actually gets uh, uh, beneficial. Uh, but here you can see after one minute, it says, so that means that uh, um, after installation, you have, a, what is it, 10, 9, 8, 7 hertz resonance frequency. And after 20 years, it, it, it starts shifting upwards towards higher frequencies. But this is just one hertz. So this should be, you know, that shouldn't, uh, kind of uh, destroy your designed uh, sound isolation. Uh, and this company actually has uh, really um, know-how in long-term installations that they, that they did. Yeah, we have projects that are 20 years old that have no issues in that respect. And there is a, we can also mention that quickly, there's an extremely elegant way of replacing those if you need to do that. They, that same company deep freezes them in a compressed state, at like negative 200 something. Then you actually put them in below with the little holders and what do I know? And uh, then they actually expand while they're warming up again. And then you have them replaced. So you could even do that, although that's really crazy to do that. So no, there's no problem in the timeline, in the life, lifetime expectancy for that. And there is a question from Alex Krasnick for Gabe. How much importance do you place on designing porous inst installation materials such as mineral wool to reduce the resonance effect within air cavities? That's uh, very important. Yeah, yeah absolutely. The, the, the insulation between the layers 
is, is crucial and it's one of the reasons why designing sound isolation windows is so difficult. Um, the commercially available windows, they have a gas in between uh, the, the two uh, layers of, of, uh, of glass. Uh, but if we install these, these special studio windows, which are usually a frame with a, a thick glass, a laminated glass, and then we have airspace, and then we have another frame with a thick isolating glass, um, we cannot put any insulation in between. So there's just air in between. And that actually reduces the sound isolation a lot. So we try to have as much uh, absorption as you can around the frame uh, to really kind of uh, try to absorb as much of the uh, resonances in between the glass. Also, we angle the glass, of course, to not have just one frequency to spread the frequency out, uh, make, make the dip uh, in, in, in isolation less uh, severe. That's great. And from Diego Fernandez, Branif. Uh, what standards or ISOs do you currently follow or use to get the best results on airborne and structural noise? I guess isolation, correct. There is any ISO, ISO? Uh, well, you mean the, the, I don't understand correctly, maybe uh, the, the standards that we design to or? Yes, maybe if you are using and that, that is actually or measure to that, that it, may be it, also it, the question. Yeah. Okay. It, it differs. It really differs from country to country, which, which standards are applicable and which aren't. So uh, in Switzerland, it's different than it is in, 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 uh, in uh, England or in, in the US. So uh, we usually have to see first what is actually required uh, from a legal point of view. Understood. And I, I guess Derek, this will be for you. Uh, from an anonymous attendee, the best low budget isolation tips. <laughs> Call me, I'll help you. <laughs> That's good. Uh, no, actually, it's bad news for that question. I, I, I teach a lot and I always say, guys, girls, uh, when you deal with isolation, that's really something that you should not toy with because it can be an extremely complex and expensive uh, party to fix anything that comes up way when you're all done with everything, uh, basically, because all that stuff that we talked about is basically hidden behind the structure. So this is, there's not really, a, a, I mean, I've seen, I've seen many, I've seen many things that did not work though, like tennis balls. I saw rooms uh, on tennis balls. Okay. Like a lot of tennis ten and then put the floor panels on that. That's funny for a drum razor, but not really for your studio room, I, I, I think. Uh, I'm afraid I can't really, really, really be very specific on, on, on a super low budget uh, isolation. This stuff that, that we kind of showed you, it's not super expensive. I have to also say this is a, a couple of euro a piece, maybe, maybe seven or, or eight or nine, but and you need a couple of hundreds. You don't need thousands and tens of thousands of that. So it's like a couple of thousand to the hardware to isolate a room. You have to build a room anyway. You have to build gypsum and, and, and a door and a window. So, so just use that stuff wisely. Ask people that know about it. Uh, the manufacturers are often a good, good source. Uh, of course, we are a, a possible source. Other experts, um, you, you, you really need some help to get that correctly done. Uh, an absorber is quickly built and quickly put in the, put in a dump if it needs to be done. But uh, isolation is really, really tricky to, to, uh, to get it not right in the first. Uh, in the first I, I guess that one good advice, as John Storick used to mention, try to start with a quiet spot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is and a good no point. Neighbors. Yeah, you go to, go to an Alp, exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, Just have one room and uh, no neighbors, no sheep, etc. And uh, a question from Kevin McCoy. I think it's interesting for both of you guys. Uh, does the sound isolation work in both directions? Are there any techniques or some techniques that will only work in one direction? Maybe you want to take that? Yeah, no, it works in, in both directions. As long as we're talking about um, fully isolated room within room constructions. If we're just talking about one layer, let's say I built a, um, let's say we have a concrete structure and I built a floating floor in my apartment, but nobody else does then 
my uh, uh, noise that I produce on the floor gets reduced towards the uh, tenant below, but his noise when he's walking on his concrete floor will be transmitted through the walls into my apartment. So that is a difference. But if we're talking about room within room, it's, uh, it's the same from both directions. Yeah, it's often also required in both directions because if you want the, the club not to hear the, 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 the dump truck uh, passing by in the street. And you also don't want to have the, the neighbors here the club. So it, it, it usually you want both directions. And they are, they are in both directions. Sometimes the measurement standards uh, do differ be between like source and receiver room. Obviously, we also made a determination on particular measurements, but they, the values are the same that you get from both measures. But some radiation, uh, like if, you, if you're outside before in, in front of a window, it, the radiation of sound is a little different than when you're inside the room. And again, those uh, reverb times uh, correction factors come in, come in play there. Uh, any particular software that you use for your simulation acoustics isolation simulation phase in the projects? Yep. Yes. Yeah, we use multiple uh, different softwares. Uh, as you've seen before, for the springs, we have uh, the calculator that determines resonance frequencies for the springs. We have we use Norflag. It used to be called Windflag, which is a simulation of uh, uh, layers. Um, uh, boundaries uh, but Sandwiched. that all that only yep. yeah that only gives us a sound isolation of of one um, uh, built up like an RW but if we if we need the DNTW which is a sound isolation from one room to another room we have all the flanking transmission that needs to be taken into consideration and for that we use uh, Katna B it's now called it used to be called Bastian and now it's Katna B which allows us to uh, position rooms in a building and define the um, properties of the existing structure and of uh, whatever we built inside and then it calculates the uh, the sound uh, transmission including oralization you can listen to your neighbor yeah. in a simulated environment before you build your studio or That's by nice. the way sound isolation is also important for residential for meeting rooms within a like a large office space we, we're talking a lot about studios, but in fact, it's really, really way, much more uh, than that. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted somebody. No, no the, I, I was going to say, yeah. Gabe and Dirk, this has been so amazing. I know that we're already 10 minutes over. Um, for anyone who is still here, which is a lot of you, um, we're not going to be able to get through all of these questions. So if there are additional questions, we will be sending out an email um, in about 48, 72 hours. Um, answering every single question you have. So if there are additional questions, please put them in the Q&A just before we sign off here. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone for their time. We love doing these. Dirk, Gabe, this has been absolutely fascinating. Um, Sergio, thank you. thank you for manning the Q&A and asking the questions and everyone else, thank you so much for attending. Um, and again, we will send out an email with the uh, recording of the session for anyone who wants the presentation, um, can we make it available? Dirk, Ted? The video will of be Of course, available. of course, at a big charge, as much as about <laughs> these things cost. No, don't, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Free for everybody who's interested. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. the interest. We're honored to have you all in here. I see it's a very high number and we are very much honored that you all made it. And uh, a lot of them uh, made it through until even the 10 extra minutes. So we're extremely, <laughs> extremely honored by that. Thank you so much, everybody. And Thanks, everyone. Uh, tschüss naar Nederland nog. Ik heb je bemerking gezien, Ronald. Ik kom er nog wel op terug. <laughs> and, if you have the thing. <laughs> and if you have the time, please take the survey as soon as we end the session here. That would be really helpful to us all. Thank you so much. Super. Thank, Thank you. Thanks bye -bye. a lot. You all have a tschüss. good day. Tschüss. Ciao.